I would like to welcome you all to this session on ICHT Global Platform for Harmonization. My name is Gabriela Zenhuizen. I'm the ICH Assembly Vice Chair, and I'm here today to introduce you to ICH. And you will have a dense program of training over the next couple of days. And unfortunately, I can't be here today in person because I will be traveling to Korea just in a couple of days. But I'm pleased at least to send you a message uh, through this presentation today. Um, my name is Gabriela Zenhuis, and as I've mentioned before, uh, I work at Swiss Medic. Um, I'm involved in regulation for a number of years now, uh, first in the sector authorization at Swiss Medic. Afterwards, um, I supported the WHO in the regulatory system strengthening team. I'm, I'm back at Swiss Medic since 2019 and mainly responsible for international collaboration. I'd like to give you like an introduction to ICH for those of you who are not that familiar with and I would just give you some background information and if you have questions then afterwards uh, you can always send them to me by email. The organizers have the contact. I would like to start with the very beginning of this initiative. Um, ICH uh, was founded in 1990 and it's a unique harmonization initiative for regulators and pharmaceutical industries. This is quite an important fact and you will see that in all working groups that develop guidelines that you have regulators represented as well as industry and they do negotiate to, to get to a consent um, for a new guideline or a revision of a guideline between regulators and industry. In 2015, ICH was reformed and it is now a non-profit legal entity under Swiss law and it opened up for many regulators and for more industry or a different role for industry representatives. Here you see the mission of ICH and I'll give you a bit of time to, to read through that mission. And as the title of ICH says, it's all about harmonization of guidelines and what guidelines are being developed under ICH, you will see uh, in a couple of minutes. The purpose of ICH. The purpose is to promote public health and this is done through the drafting of guidelines which cover different areas like it can start um, from manufacturing of medicines to the authorization procedure and afterwards the surveillance uh, which is as important and the aim of ICH is to avoid or to prevent from unnecessary duplication and I'll give you an example on guidelines to clinical trials or good clinical practices later, but this is just one of, of the purposes. And as I mentioned before, manufacturing, so it includes also the development and manufacturing of new medicines, registration and supervision, post-authorization safety, and in general, it also supports the reduction of unnecessary animal testing. Here you have a list of ICH members. I wanted to highlight MFDS, but unfortunately I missed to do so, but you see, the MFTS listed here under regulatory members as well. And first you see the founding members, which is um, the European Commission and EMA, MHLW, PMDA, Japan and FDA, as well as their industry associations, so FPA, JPMA and Pharma. And these were the members that originally found um, ICH. Then Swiss Medic joined and Health Canada. Um, Swiss Medic first as a representative of EFTA states and Health Canada joined as well. And since 2015, and when it opened up, many more members joined ICH. And you also have the industry sector, its bio and global self-care federation, as well as IGBA. ICH has also many observers and here uh, you have a list of observers or not the full list, but you will find them on the website. But this is the status of October 2022 and there are two standing observers, which is the WHO, the World Health Organization and IFPMA, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. And as well, you have 35 observers and these are not just the regulatory authorities, it's also regional harmonization initiatives such as APEC or ASEAN and others and you have international industry pharmaceutical organizations and organizations that are affected by ICH guidelines. 
I would like to show you some of the success stories, and I'm sure you're familiar with most of them uh, in the next couple of minutes. And as a first one, I would like to mention the good clinical practices. Uh, the first guideline was drafted in 1996. And here you have a quote of Toshiyoshi Tomiaga, and he's the former ICH Assembly Vice Chair and ICH MC Vice Chair um, from the MHL WPMDA. And you would find that quote also in the brochure where you find the reference at the end of this presentation. I'll give you a couple of minutes to go through this one. I would like to mention that um, the guidelines, um, there are two which I'm talking about, it's E6 and E8, it's good clinical practices and general considerations for clinical trials. Um, they were both revised or are being revised and there was a reflection paper in 2018, um, the GCP renovation reflection paper, and here it was decided. But these are two very important guidelines. Um, as the name says, and the good clinical practice guideline um, has been, is currently being revised and the E8 general considerations for clinical trials guideline has been um, adopted in October 2021. So you will find a an, an revised version on our website. This is certainly one of the examples and it, it tried to support the manufacturers to, to plan clinical trials. Another one is the CTD or the ECTD, the Common Technical Document Structure. And I'm pretty sure you've all seen this structure if you're working in regulation. Um, the dossiers that manufacturers submit to industry, uh, to regulators, are structured in that way. You have module one, uh, which is the national information, and then you have module two with the summaries, module three, four, and five with the quality non-clinical and clinical study reports. And the ECTD is the electronic version of this um, document, um, which is then summarized in ICH guideline M8. And here as well, um, currently, the ICH M4 working group, um, they revise one part of the CTD and they focus on the quality submission. And so, which means module three, and it will be newly structured. It will not, they will not invent something new, but they will just reorganize the document. But this is certainly, Everyone, all regulators and industry are very familiar with this triangle. And the third one, uh, we may sometimes forget, but MEDRA, they have a management committee, which is under ICH as well. And it is that um, the first version of this terminology was implemented or endorsed in 1994. And it's the medical terminology that is developed by ICH to facilitate sharing of regulatory information. And you see the very high numbers of subscribers um, up to 2021 and more than 7,400 organizations have joined now and in of more than 130 countries. And currently it's being translated in, in various languages also in the European room, and there are many other languages available. Here, this is the product of ICH and its guidelines, as I've mentioned a couple of times before, that are developed in collaboration uh, with industry and regulators. And you see here the number of guidelines. All together, it's close to 70 guidelines that are being developed or being revised um, when there is need. And you have the terminology. And you have also certainly seen this QSEM that refers to quality, safety, efficacy, and multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary, for example, as I've just mentioned before, it's the elect electronic standards. And a few words to the structure of ICH, of the ICH Association. Um, on the top head, you see the assembly. I'll give you some more information on this later on, on the responsibilities of the assembly. On the left hand side, you would see the ICH management committee. On right hand side, the MEDRA management committee. You have the ICH secretariat that is doing a tremendous work to, to make this feasible, this work to organize the meetings uh, which take place under normal circumstances without a pandemic twice a year. And you have the ICH coordinators, which are the link between the ICH secretariat and the members or observers. And of course, last but not least, um, the working groups of the different 
um, areas. The Assembly is the overarching body of the association and it is composed of all the members that take decisions regarding the articles of association, rules of procedures, where you find, for example, how the working groups are organized or have to be organized, and the admission of new members or adoption of guidelines. Um, basically, all decisions are taking place in the Assembly and it takes decisions by consensus. And I haven't encountered any situation where there was no consensus, but in case there is no consensus to vote in accordance with the articles of associations, where only regulatory members have the right to vote. So a little bit more weight is given to the regulators. The management committee, they oversee the operational aspects. And you would have here also the subcommittees on new topic. Um, proposals or new topics, for example, or the implementation, which is now no longer active, but it did a lot of work on a survey on how to implement or how guidelines are implemented by regulators. Um, or there is a finance subcommittee and a training subcommittee, which is as important as well. And they do recommend to the assembly if a guideline, for example, should be adopted or not or if a new topic should be launched or not, which then afterwards, subsequently, the assembly would take the decision. Just a few words on how a regulator can become a member of the association. And I've mentioned at the very beginning for MFDS, the status is clear. They are a regulatory member and they are part of the management committee. But just that you have a good understanding on what is required to become a member. And the first part, I think, is quite clear that they have to attend uh, ICH meetings and that they need to appoint experts in working groups. But a bit more even important, I would say, is the second part. Um, they need to show that they have implemented the tier one guidelines. And it's Q1 stability testing, Q7 good manufacturing practice guide for active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, and E6 good clinical practice. And this is very important. For industry, it's a bit different. Of course, they need to be um, active in participation of meetings, but they need to be an international pharmaceutical industry organization. It cannot be a local one or a national one. So they need to be linked, such as IFPMA, for example, um, that covers many areas and not just one country. And the organization, of course, must be regulated or affected by ICH guidelines. Just a few words to ICH observers. This is also possible and as a first step, um, regulators apply to become an observer, obviously, and they have the right to attend the meetings, but they do not have the right to vote or you have the standing observers, as I've mentioned before, WHO and IFPMA, and they have the right to appoint an expert to the working groups. Here you see uh, the composition of ICH um, working groups, and this is also published in this brochure. Um, these are the numbers of 2021, but it just shows you how active ICH is and how many working groups are currently doing um, the work. And you have more than 700 experts in, in 34 working groups, and this is a, a very high number. And you see that, um, of course, I think, the founding members are and standing members are mostly represented, but you see a high um, attendance of, of members and um, a slightly lower one from observers, which is understandable. This is very important too, and I'm sure uh, all of you have been involved in, in drafting a guideline. You will be well aware of this. If you have heard about ICH, uh, you may have heard about talking of the steps. And this is the system of the process of drafting a guideline. It, uh, if a guideline is being revised, it goes to the, to the same steps. So it goes from one to five. And you would see the first step is quite an important one. That's where industry and regulators work together and draft the technical document. It is then signed off by the topic leaders and subsequently it goes for endorsement to the assembly and to the regulators. And you see here that the ICH parties consensus on technical document and the draft adoption by draft guideline adoption by the regulators is considered a step way uh, to. Then you have step three, that's the regulatory 
a consultation and it goes um it is being published on the website of ICH and several regulators and industry, they publish the document too for public consultation and stakeholders have the possibility to comment on the guidelines. And these comments are then implemented or not, depending on if um, there is support or not. And as a last step, it's step four or a second last step, I have to say, but an important step, it's the adoption of an ICH harmonized guideline. And you will find the final document on the website. And step five is the phase of implementation. Means that the guideline has to be implemented or is recommended to be implemented at the regulator. And this can take um, not much time depending on the character of the guideline. If it's, for example, an electronic standard, then it may take more time for implementation. And you would also find a list um, where regulators declare they do a self-declaration on the implementation. I will come back to that later. But these are the five steps uh, which you should remember on how a guideline is being developed or being revised. And you will find all that information as well on the ICH website. The big question is how can a new topic be selected? And there is a process um, which is undertaken um, or evaluated by the ICH um, MC subcommittee of new topics. And here you see a few steps um, that are required for a new topic. So stakeholders can submit a new topic. All ICH members, I have to say, and specifying observers can submit new topic um, proposals. They are then subsequently um, evaluated by that subcommittee and there is a recommendation to the management committee, to the ICH management committee to support the topic or not. Then there will be a discussion. It goes to the assembly and the assembly takes a decision if um, a new topic can be launched or not. And if so, the next step is the fifth one. And you see that's the development of a concept paper and the business paper and the business plan. And those two documents are published on the website as well. And at that stage, before these two documents are being um, endorsed, it's considered to be an informal working group. And point six, you would then see the review and adoption, adoption of the concept paper and business plan by the ICH management committee. And then it goes for information to the ICH assembly and the establishment of an expert working group. And then there is an email out from ICH secretariat and you can nominate your experts to their working group. And usually there is a call for submission of new topic proposals by about mid-December, and then it goes through all that process. A few words on the implementation. I've mentioned it before, um, that's step five. And guidelines, once implemented, form a common backbone of technical requirements. And as the guidelines are harmonized, that means that um, across the globe, regulators and industry work with the same guidelines, or at least this is the aim. And members they do commit um, to implement the guidelines and they need to show uh, in a self-declaration what guidelines they have implemented and they are reporting on a status you would find always a table of guidelines and the implementation status of, of an agency and you would also find that for Swiss Medic or for the MFDS and there was, uh, that's the last bullet point, and a third party survey that was conducted and it was first led by industry and in a second phase uh, regulators could contribute as well. And so it gives actually a quite good picture of how um, guidelines are implemented. And I think uh, it is a recommendation, but it, it helps industry and the regulators to work globally and to have harmonized requirements. It helps a lot for collaboration as well. And in different work schemes or procedures you have in your agency, um, that is certainly helpful. He just summarized again, and that's a um, picture or a graphic out of um, the 30 uh, anniversary brochure. And you find here step one implementation based on self-declaration. That's what I mentioned before. Um, step two is adequacy of implementation based on modifications. So you have to, 
to declare um, which part you couldn't implement or to what extent it's implemented. And of course, um, the recommendation is to adhere then to the guidelines. Before I close, I would like to um, show you some keys to ICH success. And I think I've mentioned it a couple of times, but I think it's really unique that industry and regulators close that work that closely together to draft these guidelines. And if they are accepted by both parts, um, by both stakeholders, then this certainly um, is a success and it facilitates the collaboration. The second one, of course, it's science-based and consensus-driven. This, I think, is understandable if you see the process and it's a non-political organization and close collaboration of parties with comparable uh, regulatory and technical capability. Um, commitment to implement the products. Uh, I've mentioned that a couple of times too. And um, you have global platform and tools, um, not only for collaboration, but internationally, but also for collaboration within a country with the regulator and the industry. And it's a clearly an effectively managed process. If you are involved in, in ICH directly, you would see that it is highly regulated actually, and the ICH Secretariat is, a great, is doing a great job in facilitating all um, the updates of the articles, for example, the, the rules of procedures and, and the collaboration in general and the exchange between the different parties of ICH. Before I close, you see here a quote from Mike Ward, and you're attending a training here over the next couple of days on a, on a number of guidelines. I had received the agenda before, and I'm actually impressed to how many trainings on different sessions that are organized. And Mike Ward was involved in ICH for a long time, and you may some of you may remember him. And he said as well that training is fundamental. And I've give you I'm giving you here a couple of um, we need again to read through that. So I would like to congratulate you um, that you're all here uh, together and that you will go through this training and it is crucial to understand the guidelines that are being developed and I'm sure with the highly qualified colleagues um, giving lectures here you will have a great time and a much better understanding of the different guidelines after that week. Um, I would like to give you some references and um, whenever uh, you need some information, you would find information on the ICH website. Um, here you have the press release of the Assembly of May 2022. There will be one after the week now in Korea, um, which will start uh, anytime soon. You have the brochure, which summarizes very well what ICH has achieved and how it was developed over the last 30 years. And you have leaflet with, for example, just to see um, how ICH guidelines are being developed. And with that, I would like to close the session. Um, here a picture of the last meeting, ICH meeting in Athens we had where you could find the press release. And these are all the people involved and the working groups are missing here, but you see even the assembly, it's a high number of regulators and industry representatives from all over the world that collaborate. With this, I would like to close. I'm wishing you a great session over the next couple of time. Ask questions whenever you have and make most out of it. Thank you very much.